Okay, we are recording. Screen is shared, um, but there'll be nothing interesting on it for a while. Uh, let me just, so I don't forget to get these monitors on. Okay, there we go. Enjoy looking at that WebEx screen. That's great. Um, okay, so narrative design, let's talk about it a little bit. So you're interested in game narrative, and you want to pursue that as your game industry career. So uh, the good news is you can totally do that, right? That That's perfectly valid, um, you know, sort of career choice if, okay, it's gone about the right way. And that, that's a big if, right? So if you remember what I said about being a game designer in that lecture, it's very similar here where, okay, most of us had kind of an image in our brain of what a game designer is, uh, sort of the mastermind, you know, the puppeteer of everything. You think of Miyamoto and Kojima and Sid Meier and you know, all these people. Uh, you know, Ken Levine, whoever you, you want to think of, and you're like, I want to be that. And then kind of what you learn is that, well, in order to get my foot in the door as a designer, I have to sort of do these other tasks that are design related, you know, level design, level scripting, all that. And that's going to get me in so that I can maybe someday get to the level of influence that some of these other folks have. You tend not to start that way unless you go into indie games. And that's, you know, uh, even, by the way, one thing that Dr. Wooding Hill says about indie that I'll mention, too, real real fast, is that it is true that most people that succeed in indie game development, they usually go into the industry first for a while and then come back out and become an indie developer. They gain contacts, knowledge, all that. That's not to say it can't happen the other way, but that's very, very common, okay? Just uh, putting that pebble in your shoe. So getting back to narrative design, yeah, it's sort of the same thing, right? Where, where I see a successful path for you narrative folks is you want to take that, uh, what we would consider a lot of the skills that would go into that, like, um, you know, sort of creative writing ability, script writing, dialogue, uh, all of that stuff. Obviously, you got to have all those skills, but you want to marry it to some technical skills in engine that make sense, right? Uh, now, I'm not going to tell you all to go be a uh, you know engine programmer uh now i'm sure you know if you want to that's great uh but that's probably not for a lot of narrative folks uh the, the sort of marriage of skills that happens typically i think and this is going to sound like i'm just promoting my discipline but it just so happens i think it's such a great fit having some kind of level design focus really makes a lot of sense if you want to be uh, a narrative designer in the industry for a bunch of different reasons. One, when you think about what a level designer does, think about what I talked about last week. It is someone who is really putting the game content together, constructing the moment-to-moment -moment experience. So you will have a lot of control over the game's narrative because you are controlling quite literally what's happening, you know, from a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So you know, let's say you're not the person writing the game dialogue. Uh, someone's got to, like, make the game dialogue actually happen. That's going to be you. And often you will be writing game dialogue. Now, maybe it gets replaced later when they hire a writer or something. But, like, you know, you are controlling the narrative in a very powerful way. Now, um, what you can do with, you know, with this sort of hybrid is once you get started you can then begin to select jobs that are more narrative oriented. So there's a career arc I want to mention specifically here. Actually, I just retweeted his his game today on Twitter. If any, anyone follows me on Rojo Games on Twitter, uh, this fellow named Mark Soskin, really good example of what I'm talking about, right? So Mark, uh, he went to the same school I went I went to, but uh, SMU Guildhall. But he went there uh, some years, you know, after, you know, he's younger. Uh, he was a level designer at Human Head that we hired, uh, you know, so I was kind of, you know, senior to him there. We worked together a lot and he was game narrative was 100 percent his thing, his bag. Right. Uh, but, you know, he got started at Human Head as just a level designer doing all the usual level design stuff. OK, um, but once he got that kind of first job, he was able to then select a second job because, see, here's the thing you get. You get that first job, you get that first game credit, you are suddenly much more marketable. You, it is so much easier to get the second job after you get the first job. Getting the first job is all about, like, proving to people that it's that chicken and the egg problem, right? Like, everyone wants experienced devs. You're not experienced yet, right? Uh, how do you know? So that that's why. that That's one of the hardest things to do. But once you do get that, 
then you know you have this ability to be more selective. So he went and became a, a, literally a narrative designer for that uh, for Arc Survival Evolved. Uh, you know, I think that's in Washington State where that developer is. Uh, so he would write story things for them and all that. Uh, then he went and did narrative design work for the Outer Worlds at Obsidian, right? Like, and really that was, uh, I thought he would just hit the jackpot. I thought, man, Mark is exactly where he wants to be working at a great story-based studio. I'm sure a lot of you would be like, holy crap, Obsidian, that's awesome. But then he did the next thing, which almost ties into what Dr. Woodinghill talks about. He left Obsidian, had a successful Kickstarter, and now is making his own uh, visual novel that looks really interesting. And now he's purely in, in the narrative realm now, right? But that's a really good example of someone who went, learned how to do level design, scripting, work in engine, all of that stuff, uh, then was able to use that to kind of get into the industry and then get the jobs uh, that, you know, he, he sort of desired. So is this, is this making sense um, to you all? Uh, I hope so. Any questions about this? Yeah. So uh, let me make sure I understand your question. Are you saying that you that you should be should you be studying creative writing, um, like as you're studying game development? Is that the question? Yeah, I, look, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, because you're getting you know what we're going to get you uh, if you like are a games major at CGT, you're going to get all that wonderful kind of. I hate saying hard skills because I don't want to like denigrate like, you know, I love writing, right? But you know what I mean. You're going to get those technical skills uh, that are going to sort of get a developer to pay attention to you. And I'm now opening the chat to make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay, good. Uh, but, you know, the creative writing minor would allow you, you know, to, this opportunity to, to develop this other craft, right? That is a valid path, yes. Um, in any case, the overall idea is there are certain skill sets that will kind of open doors for you. And, and what we hope to do here at Purdue is give you those. And then, you know, sort of the world is your oyster then and, and what you become after that. Uh, okay, any more uh, questions on this? Because I really wanted to address this because there were so many of you that were interested. In, yeah. Okay, so that's a great question. So the question for statewide... Uh, what's the difference between uh, between a writer and a narrative designer? Okay, all right. So a writer, and there, and those people do exist uh, in the games industry. Uh, really, they are. Uh, you know, you hire a writer very specifically to not. You know, they're not going to be in engine. Uh, typically, at most, they'll open up like an Excel spreadsheet to organize dialogue, and but it is very hyper focused. Uh, and so very typically when writers of that sort are hired, uh, they're, we're going to be drawing from the already very large pool of like, you know, people that are in Hollywood and working in TV and th that may also work in games. So that's one of the reasons why that, that becomes difficult, especially at entry level is you're competing with this massive group of, you know, already existing people. Now, narrative design what makes it different is we would expect you to be able to go in engine and implement narrative things. You may be doing a lot of writing, right? That those skills would still exist for you, but you're going to take that stuff and you're going to do the things you need to do to actually make that, make those things happen in engine. So you might be implementing dialogue within the unreal engine or unity. Uh, you might be doing very level designer type things to make that happen, right? Scripting, some light programming, uh, that sort of thing. So that's kind of the difference is how close to the game we would expect you to be able to be essentially. Right. Um, so does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Any other questions on this? These are excellent questions, by the way. Um, okay. All right. So, uh, all right. Thank you for listening to that. I, I hope that served you all well. Let's go into, uh, the official lecture now. Um, We'll see if we can get through this, but uh, I've surprised myself before. All right, so we're going to talk about today uh, game development from soup to nuts, okay? So literally from the moment a game 
percolates in your head as, as an idea all the way until you get that box in your hands, right? All the way at the end. Uh, we'll see. This may bleed over into Wednesday. We'll see how long this takes. Okay, so how do video games get made? And look, it's a team picture of Cold Iron. Uh, that's me right there, a much fatter version of myself. Um, and uh, as a quick aside, that was one of our company anniversary things. We were playing broom ball, which is like hockey without skates, and you hit a rubber ball. And uh, just briefly, it was actually one of the worst days uh, <laughs> at my time at Cold Iron because you can't tell in that picture, but I had – taken a swing with the with the hockey stick and fell on the ice like chest first like the full body momentum just crashed and i thought i cracked a rib i mean i was in so much pain i didn't but like i was really sore couldn't sleep on that side of my body for like six weeks um she's like the nicest person on earth but i blame her right here lila Nossinger, who's the company uh who at that time was the office manager she is like the the, the most amazing nicest person but i blame you lila all right uh so video games are made via system of milestones all right beta alpha uh that, that sort of thing okay so milestones are checkpoints in which progress is gauged and every checkpoint has specific goals that the project stakeholders, that's a software uh, engineering project management term that's often thrown around. These are publishers. Uh, I'm your stakeholder for stuff you do for me in this class. Uh, you know, just whoever is, you know, sort of in charge. Um, now, these will always vary from company to company. Okay, so... To make this slide less boring, I do try to bring in, like, funny animations, uh, which hopefully some of them are amusing. So, uh, getting greenlit. Now, this phase isn't talked about a lot, but, gosh, it's probably one of the most important because unlike, see, when you make games for us at Purdue, guess what? You know, you, you just get to make them. We say you make game, you go make game. In the real world, yes, you can make games on your own and, and all that, but if you're going to do it for a living, you need to get someone – with deep pockets to pay you. Uh, by the way, that's Oliver Twist, uh, incidentally, asking for more soup. It's my favorite analogy for this sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, getting greenlit super important. And even crowdfunded games, there's usually some investor or publisher in the wings, you know, uh, providing more money. Because if you look at how much games get on Kickstarter, it's, it's a pittance of what they actually need, right? So, you know, these things are usually like almost like test runs of, of public interest. Okay, so what? how do you get greenlit? Like what things typically happen? So um, yes, you're going to make pitch documents, PowerPoint decks, presentations. Uh, you may include things like a market analysis to justify something called a business case. What is a business case? That is simply uh, your pitch as to why this would do well in the marketplace, right? And it could be any number of things. If you were making a Dark Souls type game, your business case would be, look at all these games like Dark Souls that do well. We're going to do, you know, a game just like that. Or conversely, if you make a game that is sort of a medieval sword and board RPG, but is not like Dark Souls, you can actually do the opposite. You can be like, look, no one's making like sort of Devil May Cry-ish style action games, uh, with but everyone's doing this Dark Souls thing. We're different, right? Whatever the business case may be, you try to make it. Uh, now, uh, you may make a demo of some sort. And actually, uh, with demos, it, it basically works like this. The less reputation you have, the more a demo is required. If you are a brand new developer, no one's ever heard of you, you have no contacts, no reputation, you better have a really, really kick-ass demo, right? I mean, that, that should make sense. You're unproven. Now, if you're a studio, like when I was working at Human Head Studios, for instance, kind of a long-running, you know, they go back to 1997, they've made a bunch of games, you know, they have a reputation. So probably you can pitch with, you know, PowerPoints and presentations and, and those sorts of things, uh, you know. So that's kind of how that works. Also, you know, a studio like Human Head, frankly, they're going to be too busy working on all these work for hire projects, uh, you know, to, you know, get everyone to like pitch into a, a demo usually. So that's, that's part of it as well. 
All right. What did I do for this one? Ah, yes. Tony Stark. Thank you. Right. So uh, the demo, by the way, a lot of a lot of times that's throwaway work. You're not going to actually build the real game with it. You're just using it to convince someone to you know pay you to make it. OK, so how does that process work? The typical green light process. So uh, believe it or not, it's actually not usually. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, maybe it's a little bit like that. I don't know. Uh, but um, it's usually not, hey, I have an awesome game idea or company has an awesome game idea and I'm going to share that. I mean, that's sure that happens. But more often, the publisher, uh, if you're working at an established developer, right, with a reputation, they're going to be directly soliciting you for a pitch. This happened all the time at Human Head where uh, like Sony would send to 20 developers, they know, hey, we have this uh, VR headset coming out, and boy golly, it would be nice if we had some VR games, right? So we are asking you to give us a pitch. Uh, and that happens a lot, where publishers be like, hey, you know, we don't have, we don't have a action platformer in our portfolio. Can you pitch us something that you would do in that space? Or hey, we just made an exclusive deal with Twitch, and if you feel like you have a game concept that would be really great for uh, you know, Twitch streamers, whatever it is, right? Uh, you know, This is very, very common. Publisher solicits you. So already you're seeing the difference maybe between how it might have worked in your head versus reality to where the publisher is already kind of limiting, limiting what you know, you're even going to pitch, right? Like when a publisher asks you for hey, I want uh, something that's sort of like Breath of the Wild, you're probably not going to give them Street Fighter, right? I mean, so immediately you begin to see why, if you ever wonder, why is the games industry so samey and boring? Well, you know, this is a tip as to why that might happen. Um, okay, so let's say you get one of these solicitations and you deliver a pitch. They really like it, okay? They're going to, you know ask for meetings, right? And these are going to be the top people at your company. You know, if you're just a uh, working grunt, you know, you're probably not participating in these meetings, executive level stuff, very high level. They're just talking blue sky, you know, just to see if there's a good personality fit. Um, and there's going to be a lot of revisions here to this pitch that that's me, right? The publisher will be like, gosh, we really like this survival horror game you're making. Uh, but we really feel like uh, we need it to be in first person, not third person. You know, th there'll be things like that that happen. So there'll be some back and forth on the game uh, concept. Okay, so if things go well, the publisher may ask for milestone schedules and budget proposals, the president business stuff, okay? Um, and if things go really well, right? So you give them a schedule, you give them a budget proposal, they agree with it. They, you know, things that can happen here, by the way, is uh, sometimes, and this is a tough place for a developer to be in, they'll be like, hey, your head counts 40, but you need like 100 people. And then we'll say, uh, well, yes, but we're going to hire those people. And then the publisher will say, that's BS. You'll, you cannot possibly hire that many people in the time span needed by, right? And then as a developer, you get into a tough situation because uh, if you go out and hire a huge team in order to get bigger projects, you're going to run out of money paying those people, right? Uh, but if you don't have a large team, you don't get the big projects. This is what makes game dev hard. It's why there's so few game devs left that aren't owned by a bigger company, right? I mean, that's a really hard thing to manage. So if all that goes well, you get the due diligence visit. Okay, this, the publisher arrives just to make sure, they really wanna make sure that it isn't just a bunch of people with a cardboard box that has computer written on it, right? I mean, they're showing up to make sure that you're like a real developer, that, you, that the lights are on, the bills are getting paid, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, when I was, you know, working for developers, the due diligence stage is when I would start to get excited. All the stuff before that, and this could be months of stuff before you get to due diligence, I would not care about. I learned to be very jaded about it. Like all kinds of proposals are happening, all kinds of work are, is being pitched back and forth. But until the publisher actually arrives at your doorstep to make sure that, you know, we're not just a bunch of fake charlatans, I, I wouldn't care, right? So due diligence typically means things are serious. 
All right, so uh, if the due diligence visit goes well, then there's contract negotiations, uh, you know, uh, again, which again, there's going to be some back and forth there. And hopefully you're greenlit after this. There actually is uh, a signature. So great success. You've been greenlit. You know, this may have taken months. In fact, every project I've been on, it has taken months to get to this uh, stage. So a uh, quick anecdote. Um, lost within that game, survival horror game I did with um, Human Head. Uh, the cupboard was really bare at that time. Uh, you know, at Human Head, we were really struggling. We really needed that next project. Um, I went on a vacation. It was like the first real vacation I went on in like many years. Uh, and it was only because I lucked out into some free airline tickets to get to a cruise port. We took a cruise, one of those really cheap ones out of uh, you know, Jacksonville. I don't know if you've ever, your families have ever done that, but they're like really cheap out of there. Um, I knew when I left that we would either sign Lost Within. And the thing is, when you go on a cruise ship, there's no internet unless you pay huge amounts for it, right? Uh, so I knew that when I got back, either A, Lost Within was signed, or B, I might not have a job, and I somehow was able to put that out of my mind, and I remember getting back to the port after the cruise and immediately turning my phone on and just like nervously waiting, you know, for that, the emails to come in and see what happened, and I saw we, we got signed and we were good, right? That was the most relieved I think I've ever been in, in my career. Okay, so um, you're in pre-production now, uh, so this is the process by which you figure out how your game is made in the first place. And the way I like to think of pre-production is you are figuring out what the questions even are that you have to ask for your game, and then you're answering them. Yes, success. Okay. Uh, so what kind of questions would you ask in pre-production? You might ask, well, how does your game play? How does it look like? What does it sound like? Okay. Uh, so, you know, obviously you have a pitch, and the pitch is going to have defined some of that, but you're going deeper. So if you were pitching a survival horror game uh, and you mentioned to your publisher, well, we're going to do crafting, right? Uh, we're going to have a crafting system. Well, how does that actually work? Well, now's the time you figure that out, right? All your game mechanics, all those fancy things that you said to a publisher to try to convince them to greenlight you, now you have to really figure out what you're really doing, right? So if your pitch was a shooter MMO, like a Destiny or something, now is when you really nail down your art style specifically, to give another example. You might have said in your pitch deck, it's going to be kind of like Overwatch. Well, what does that really mean? Now you get that figured out. Yes. <laughs> You're, now it's time to think. Okay, so uh, <laughs> tech, now is the time to try to figure out technical things, right? Um, and so, uh, that's right. You hide the pain. That's right. So, uh, what you're trying to do here with some of these technical things is you want to figure out on your project, what do we know we can do? Like, what are we really confident that we can do, right? Like, okay, cool. We got that squared away. Our engine tech can handle this. No problem. What's going to require a lot of R&D? Uh, software managers, software production managers will probably call this assessing risks, right? Like, I know for a lot of producing your capstones, uh, just because of the, the, the student body we have and, and, and everything, a lot of times the big risks are, you know, character rigging animation, uh, except for the project that, that you're on, Jacob, because you do that stuff. Um, yeah, there, there you go. Uh, yeah. So, you know, but with a lot of projects, that's kind of a risk because we don't actually have a lot of people uh, that, that do real time. Maybe in your class it'll be different, but at least the state of things right now. So that's a risk, and you have to figure out what you're going to do about it. And if you don't figure out what you're going to do about it, it's just going to blow up in your face later, right? So that's a big pre-production thing. Um, so uh, you might decide to drop something if it's even if, if you can't mitigate the risk enough. So that's a big pre-production thing. Pipeline stuff. Are you using outsourcing? So when in the schedule does outsourcing come in? Like where is – are you using an American studio, an overseas studio? What are their prices? All these things, all these answers and questions are pre-production. And you'll have your own pre-production cycles here, even if it's just individual work. Uh, you know, you have to figure out how your project is going to go. And when you get to your senior capstone, then you really do have to have a good pre-production because that is your plan that you're going to use uh, to make your game. Any questions so far, by the way? I know I just, I get on a roll. 
Yes. Uh, documentation that I showed uh, May J back in January, I think it was, was that all? Yeah, so the question was, uh, uh, has the document, you know, this, um, uh, so uh, the question is, you know, I did some documentation already um, that you showed because, you know, we've worked together uh, before. Uh, is that pre-production? Yes, yes. Uh, design documentation is a big part of pre-production. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, any other questions on this so far? Yeah, uh, be, be sure to speak loud. Yes. Right. So the question is, how do you make a demo if you haven't done pre-pro and figured stuff out? Well, that's a great question. That is one of the reasons why, if you remember what I said earlier, that these demos that you use to get greenlit are often thrown in the trash. This is why, because you're the kind of the answer is it's smoke and mirrors, right? You're just, to put a term on it, game jamming. You're kind of, you know, making something that tries to approximate the game you're pitching, but you're not really being careful about it. I mean, you're just kind of throwing this together because, you know, you're just trying to demonstrate something for like 10 minutes or something. So you're really being improvisatory in a way that you wouldn't be in a full production. And that's okay because all you're using that demo for is to get the gig. You're not using it to actually be this carefully crafted edifice that you're building the whole game from, right? So it's just a different style of development. And I've been involved in a lot of demos. It is actually kind of thrilling to develop that way when you kind of just, I'm going to take all the proper planning and, and just debate over schedule. I'm just throw that in the trash. I'm just going to make game. That can be really fun, but it, it, it can blow up in your face if you try to execute an entire long project like that. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on here. Bye-bye, uh, hide the pain. Okay, so uh, the goal of a perfect pre-production is that by the end of it, the game makes itself almost because you've figured everything out. You know how everything's supposed to work. You have your systems sort of figured out. You may have even done some R&D and some engineering beforehand and and then you just sit and in the game, you just make the game, right? No problems. Uh, all the tricky technical issues solved, schedule locked down, add water, poof, game. Um, of course, you know, there's never actually been in the history of games, this is why we use Hide the Pain Herald, and I guess this is uh, uh, Hide the Pain Harriet, I guess. Uh, there's never been a perfect one ever, okay? Uh, you know, there's always pre-production things that kind of, bleed over into the real production schedule and that's because this stuff's really hard right uh but that's okay it, it, it's just you do your best uh don't let it discourage you uh the worst thing you can do is give up on having a good pre-production because of that reality uh it's much worse to not do it than to do it and realize i missed this or uh, i'm gonna have to do these things in in the production cycle um so just understand it's really hard to get it completely right and hardly anybody does Okay, so now we've done our pre-production. Now we're into production. Yay, right, we're making the game. Yes. So now we do, and again, we're really getting into, every company does it a little differently and all that, so this is just my experience across three companies and working with a bunch of others. Uh, it's very typical to have some kind of first playable uh, of some sort where you know, you, you're in production, and you deliver the first thing that someone can really sit down and play. Now, in the old days, and this still happens, uh, you know, publishers really like vertical slices. Vertical slice is you take a small chunk of the game and you make it all to like a shipping quality, like all the art, all the game mechanics, like everything is polished uh, as if you could ship that little portion of the game. Hence, vertical slice it includes everything. Um, this is really hated by developers because it ends up setting uh, a lot of expectations that you don't want to be set, right? Uh, it, it, it can be problematic because then the publisher is going to look at that vertical slice and be like, well, why didn't you do that thing that you did in the vertical slice one time or, or whatever? So what I've noticed in the games industry is the, this idea of the first playable is sort of evolved alongside it, where 
it still does the thing that you want a vertical slice to do. It's still like, look, you know, we have now the game it can be played, but you you don't promise as much. You're not saying, look, this slice doesn't represent everything the game's ever going to do. Um, you know, there's still some game mechanics we haven't implemented yet and everything, but it still gives you a solid idea of of the game. And uh, often these things will have um, this thing called a beautiful corner, uh, which is a concept I really like. It's essentially a, it can be a literal corner, but it doesn't have to be. It's a section where you've decided to make all your, you polish the game's art to like a final quality. So you're running around a room or a game level it's kind of white boxed, you know, it's blocky, looks like Legos, but then you have one part of it that looks beautiful, and you do that so that the publisher can see the end result you're going for, right? The and, and that kind of does a little bit of what the vertical slice does used to do, except you're not making an entire game level like that, just maybe like a room or something. Now, this first playable, it could actually be part of your pre-production. It could be, but sometimes part of the pr production is, you know, it just depends. All right, so as we're going through production here, um, you get to that first playable. There's going to be all kinds of regular milestones, as we represent by uh, Tom Cruise running, greatest movie runner of all time. Uh, and, you know, there's a million different names for this. These aren't standardized. You might call them production one, production two, whatever. Um, but what you're really building towards is something called a minimum viable product, which is, okay, it is kind of exactly what it sounds. What is the... Uh, version of this game that we can ship, uh, you know, that we actually release, but, but the smallest version of that, right? Obviously, you hope to go beyond that. I mean, you don't want to ship an actual MVP, but that's what you're, that's what you're building towards first, right? Uh, so all the essential things your, your game needs to have. All right, so just to uh, differentiate some other things here, uh, uh, online games... Uh, any kind of MMO or a game with a significant online component, there's probably going to be, early on, a friends and family test. In fact, if you work in the industry, your friends in the industry will invite you to take part of these. I get invitations to these sort of regularly. This is where you play test your game uh, to, you know, just by a small a group of people outside the studio. And it's kind of a big deal because it's the first time people outside of your studio or publisher get to play it. Uh, but it's still a tightly knit group. It's still a small group because you're going to have ugly stuff. You're going to have white box stuff. You're going to have bugs and problems. You know, it's it's still going to be pretty ugly here. But you, the game is finished to the point where some feedback from the quote unquote public is is a valuable. Uh, and again, these can happen relatively early in development. The friends and family testing. Uh, now, um, play testing in general. Okay, ha there's a couple different schools of thought. Uh, when it comes to how to play test the game you're, you're developing, obviously it's really good to do and you should do it. That's agreed upon by all. Uh, but there's this school of thought that your entire studio should be play testing the game constantly, the whole studio. Like just you got to play test. Doesn't matter if you're a concept artist or a designer or a lighting programmer or uh, you know the office manager. You are play testing. Um, now uh, that can be good. Uh, one of the things about the constant playtesting that can actually be harmful, though, is if the game isn't showing progress, right? If all of a sudden it's like, this is the fifth week in a row I've playtested and there's no new content. And that, that can happen, easily can happen. Uh, it can actually lower morale quite a bit at a studio. I've experienced this where, you know, it just doesn't, you just don't see progress. And there might be progress happening. It just hasn't been checked into the main game yet. Uh, but you keep playtesting the same stale, broken, buggy content, and, and the studio can start to get depressed. That's kind of the downside of just we're going to have the whole studio playtesting all the time, right? It's actually surprisingly challenging uh, to manage that. Um, now, of course, the other side, if you you know have a smaller group of people playtest and it's less often, you don't get that morale problem. But then you know your game isn't looked at for like long stretches, so it's actually surprisingly hard. To balance this it's one of those things where you would think well yes i would just have people play test the stuff all the time right uh and ideally that's true but it, it can cause some some issues now this is different than like obviously a design department they're going to be play testing things constantly right that's you know to be expected 
you know, various departments at a company, they're going to be looking at in engine their stuff all the time, kind of in a vacuum. What I'm referring to here is the entire company playing the game, you know, whatever state it's it's in. All right, so you're doing all this work, you're doing all this work, and we're going to build towards alpha. So sometimes alpha is referred to as feature complete. Um, and this is when the entire game is playable with all of its features. Now, art may still be white box. It's definitely going to be buggy, and it's definitely not shippable. But it's all there. You can play all the content. And so this is a big deal to get here, right? Um, now, if you're an online game, you may now expand. You may go beyond friends and family, and you may have a, a larger group uh, of, of people now that are outside of friends and family. Uh, general public and small groupings might be uh, involved in your testing now. But yeah, alpha is a big deal, but you may still have many months of development left after alpha. Okay, beta. So um, premise of beta is that it is a shippable candidate. In theory, you can ship this and be okay. I mean, you don't really want to, but that is the theory. So uh, art should be final. Gameplay should be final. It's all should be final. There should be no serious bugs. Uh, no A bugs. A bugs would be things that stop the game, prevent player progression. B bugs are bugs that don't stop progression, don't break the game, but like look really ugly and they're obviously bad. Okay, That's you know pretty standard industry jargon. Uh, so at this point, we may start the lock check pro uh, process, a.k.a. CERT, and that's going to be basically making sure Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft uh, approve the game. You may start sending builds to them at this point. I think I'm getting close to the end here. And then you release Fruity Drinks Vacation, maybe a bonus, I hope. Uh, and when you get to this point, uh, actually sometimes, and I've had this happen um, uh, with games before, where a publisher won't even release it for a while. They'll be like, cool, the game's done, it's certified. We don't want to release it, though, until like next summer because that's a better release window. That does happen. Um, now, um, unlike the pre-internet days, there will be post-launch support. All right. Uh, in the pre-internet days, you made a game and, you know, that that's it, right? And uh, very, like a tiny f sliver of my career... Obviously, the internet was around when my career started, but like Despicable Me, the game, my first shipped game, had no online component. So that game gets launched. It's in a box. It's done forever. But obviously, for everything now, that's not really true. Um, you will move to post-launch support, but a portion of the team is going to be back, all the way 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 back to this. Now you're back to here again. Okay, we are done. Thank you.